Section 10 of The Two Paths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Albrick. The Two Paths by John Ruskin. Section 10, Lecture 4. Influence of Imagination on Architecture. Part 3. Farther yet, we are to remember that not only do the associated features of the larger architecture tend to excite the strength of fancy, but the architectural laws to which you are obliged to submit your decoration stimulate its ingenuity. Every crocket which you are to crest with sculpture, every foliation which you have to fill presents itself to the spectator's fancy not only as a pretty thing, but as a problematic thing. It contained, he perceives immediately, not only a beauty which you wish to display, but a necessity which you were forced to meet, and the problem, how to occupy such and such a space with organic form in any probable way, or how to turn such a boss or ridge into a conceivable image of life, becomes at once to him as to you a matter of amusement as much as of admiration. The ordinary conditions of perfection in form, gesture, or feature are willingly dispensed with, when the ugly dwarf and ungangly goblin have only to gather themselves into angles or crouch to carry corbels, and the want of skill which in other kinds of work would have been required for the finishing of the parts would at once be forgiven here, if you have only disposed ingeniously what you have executed roughly, and atoned for the rudeness of your hands by the quickness of your wits. Hitherto, however, we have been considering only the circumstances in architecture favourable to the development of the powers of imagination. A yet more important point for us seems, to me, the place which it gives to all the objects of imagination. For, I suppose, you will not wish me to spend any time in proving that imagination must be vigorous in proportion to the quantity of material which it has to handle, and that just as we increase the range of what we see, we increase the richness of what we can imagine. Granting this, consider what a field is open to your fancy merely in the subject matter which architecture admits. Nearly every other art is severely limited in its subjects. The landscape painter, for instance, gets little help from the aspects of beautiful humanity. The historical painter, less perhaps than he ought from the accidents of wild nature. And the pure sculptor, still less, from the minor details of common life. But is there anything within the range of sight or conception which may not be of use to you, or in which your interest may not be excited with advantage to your art? From visions of angels down to the least important gesture of a child at play, whatever may be conceived of divine or beheld of human may be dared or adopted by you. Throughout the kingdom of animal life, no creature is so vast or so minute that you cannot deal with it or bring it into service. The lion and the crocodile will crouch about your shafts. The moth and the bee will sun themselves upon your flowers. For you the fawn will leap. For you the snail be slow. For you the dove smooth her bosom and the hawk spread her wings toward the south. All the wide world of vegetation blooms and bends for you. The leaves tremble that you may bid them be still under the marble snow. The thorn and the thistle, which the earth cast forth as evil, are to you the kindliest servants. No dying petal nor drooping tendril is so feeble as to have no more help for you. No robed pride of blossom so kingly, but it will lay aside its purple to receive at your hands the pale immortality. Is there anything in common life too mean? in common too trivial, to be ennobled by your touch. As there is nothing in life, so there is nothing in lifelessness which has not its lesson for you or its gift. And when you are tired of watching the strength of the plume and the tenderness of the leaf, you may walk down to your rough river shore or into the thickest markets of your thoroughfares and there is not a piece of torn cable that will not twine into a perfect moulding, there is not a fragment of castaway matting or shattered basket-work that will not work into a checker or capital. Yes, and if you gather up the very sand, 
and break the stone on which you tread among its fragments of all but invisible shells you will find forms that will take their place and that proudly among the starred traceries of your vaulting and you who can crown the mountain with its fortress and the city with its towers are thus able also to give beauty to ashes and worthiness to dust now in that your art presents all this material to you you have already much to rejoice in but you have more to rejoice in because all this is submitted to you not to be dissected or analyzed but to be sympathized with and to bring out therefore what may be accurately called the moral part of imagination we saw that if we kept ourselves among lines only we should have cause to envy the naturalist because he was conversant with facts but you will have little to envy now if you make yourselves conversant with the feelings that arise out of his facts for instance the naturalist coming upon a block of marble has to begin considering immediately how far its purple is owing to iron or its whiteness to magnesia he breaks his piece of marble and at the close of his day has nothing but a little sand in his crucible and some data added to the theory of the elements but you approach your marble to sympathize with it and rejoice over its beauty you cut it a little indeed but only to bring out its veins more perfectly and at the end of your day's work you leave your marble shaft with joy and complacency in its perfectness as marble when you have to watch an animal instead of a stone you differ from the naturalist in the same way he may perhaps if he be an amiable naturalist take delight in having living creatures round him still the major part of his work is or has been in counting feathers separating fibres and analyzing structures but your work is always with the living creature the thing you have to get at in him is his life and ways of going about things it does not matter to you how many cells there are in his bones or how many filaments in his feathers what you want is his moral character and way of behaving himself it is just that which your imagination if healthy will first seize just that which your chisel if vigorous will first cut you must get the storm spirit into your eagles and the lordliness into your lions and the tripping fear into your fawns and in order to do this you must be in continual sympathy with every fawn of them and be hand in glove with all the lions and hand in claw with all the hawks and don't fancy that you will lower yourselves by sympathy with the lower creatures you cannot sympathize rightly with the higher unless you do with those but you have to sympathize with the higher too with queens and kings and martyrs and angels yes and above all and more than all with simple humanity in all its needs and ways for there is not one hurried face that passes you in the street that will not be impressive if you can only fathom it all history is open to you all high thoughts and dreams that the past fortunes of men can suggest all fairyland is open to you no vision that ever haunted forest or gleamed over hillside but calls you to understand how it came into men's hearts and may still touch them and all paradise is open to you yes and the work of paradise for in bringing all this in perpetual and attractive truth before the eyes of your fellow men you have to join in the employment of the angels as well as to imagine their companies and observe in this last respect what a peculiar importance and responsibility are attached to your work when you consider its permanence and the multitudes to whom it is addressed we frequently are led by wise people to consider what responsibility may sometimes attach to words which yet the chance is will be heard by few and forgotten as soon as heard but none of your words will be heard by few and none will be forgotten for five or six hundred years if you build well you will talk to all who pass by and all those little sympathies those freaks of fancy those jests in stone those workings out of problems in caprice will occupy mind after mind of utterly countless multitudes long after you are gone 
you have not like authors to plead for a hearing or to fear oblivion do but build large enough and carve boldly enough and all the world will hear you they cannot choose but look i do not mean to awe you by this thought i do not mean that because you will have so many witnesses and watchers you are never to jest or do anything gaily or lightly on the contrary i have pleaded from the beginning for this art of yours especially because it has room for the whole of your character if jest is in you let the jest be jested if mathematical ingenuity is yours let your problem be put and your solution worked out as quaintly as you choose above all see that your work is easily and happily done else it will never make anybody else happy but while you thus give the rein to all your impulses see that those impulses be headed and centred by one noble impulse and let that be love triple love for the art which you practice the creation in which you move and the creatures to whom you minister one i say first love for the art which you practice be assured that if ever any other motive becomes a leading one in your mind as the principal one for exertion except your love of art that moment it is all over with your art i do not say you are not to desire money nor to desire fame nor to desire position you cannot but desire all three nay you may if you are willing that i should use the word love in a desecrated sense love all three that is passionately covet them yet you must not covet or love them in the first place men of strong passions and imaginations must always care a great deal for anything they care for at all but the whole question is one of first or second does your art lead you or your gain lead you you may like making money exceedingly but if it come to a fair question whether you are to make five hundred pounds less by this business or to spoil your building and you choose to spoil your building there's an end of you so you may be as thirsty for fame as a cricket is for cream but if it come to a fair question whether you are to please the mob or do the thing as you know it ought to be done and you can't do both and choose to please the mob it's all over with you there's no hope for you nothing that you can do will ever be worth a man's glance as he passes by the test is absolute inevitable is your art first with you then you are artists you may be after you have made your money misers and usurers you may be after you have got your fame jealous and proud and wretched and base but yet as long as you won't spoil your work you are artists on the other hand is your money first with you and your fame first with you then you may be very charitable with your money and very magnificent with your money and very graceful in the way you wear your reputation and very courteous to those beneath you and very acceptable to those above you but you are not artists you are mechanics and drudges two you must love the creation you work in the midst of for wholly in proportion to the intensity of feeling which you bring to the subject you have chosen will be the depth and justice of our perception of its character and this depth of feeling is not to be gained on the instant when you want to bring it to bear on this or that it is the result of the general habit of striving to feel rightly and among thousands of various means of doing this perhaps the one i ought specially to name to you is the keeping yourselves clear of petty and mean cares whatever you do don't be anxious nor fill your heads with little chagrins and little desires i have just said that you may be great artists and yet be miserly and jealous and troubled about many things so you may be but i said also that the miserliness or trouble must not be in your hearts all day it is possible that you may get a habit of saving money or it is possible at a time of great trial you may yield to the temptation of speaking unjustly of a rival 
and you will shorten your powers and dim your sight even by this but the thing that you have to dread far more than any such unconscious habit or any such momentary fall is the constancy of small emotions the anxiety whether mr so-and-so will like your work whether such and such a workman will do all that you want of him and so on not wrong feelings or anxieties in themselves but impertinent and wholly incompatible with the full exercise of your imagination keep yourselves therefore quiet peaceful with your eyes open it doesn't matter at all what mr so-and-so thinks of your work but it matters a great deal what that bird is doing up there in its nest or how that vagabond child at the street corner is managing his game of knuckle-down and remember you cannot turn aside from your own interests to the birds and the children's interests unless you have long before got into the habit of loving and watching birds and children so that it all comes at last to the forgetting yourselves and the living out of yourselves in the calm of the great world or if you will in its agitation but always in a calm of your own bringing do not think it wasted time to submit yourselves to any influence which may bring upon you any noble feeling rise early always watch the sunrise and the way the clouds break from the dawn you will cast your statue draperies in quite another than your common way when the remembrance of that cloud motion is with you and of the scarlet vesture of the morning live always in the springtime in the country you do not know what leaf form means unless you have seen the buds burst and the young leaves breathing low in the sunshine and wondering at the first shower of rain but above all accustom yourselves to look for and to love all nobleness of gesture and feature in the human form and remember that the highest nobleness is usually among the aged the poor and the infirm you will find in the end that it is not the strong arm of the soldier nor the laugh of the young beauty that are the best studies for you look at them and look at them reverently but be assured that endurance is nobler than strength and patience than beauty and that it is not in the high church pews where the gay dresses are but in the church free seats where the widow's weeds are that you may see the faces that will fit best between the angel's wings in the church porch three and therefore lastly and chiefly you must love the creatures to whom you minister your fellow men for if you do not love them not only will you be little interested in the passing events of life but in all your gazing at humanity you will be apt to be struck only by outside form and not by expression it is only kindness and tenderness which will ever enable you to see what beauty there is in the dark eyes that are sunk with weeping and in the paleness of those fixed faces which the earth's adversity has compassed about till they shine in their patience like dying watch-fires through the twilight but it is not this only which makes it needful for you if you would be great to be also kind there is a most important and all essential reason in the very nature of your own art so soon as you desire to build largely and with the addition of noble sculpture you will find that your work must be associative you cannot carve a whole cathedral yourself you can carve but few and simple parts of it either your own work must be disgraced in the mass of the collateral inferiority or you must raise your fellow designers to correspondence of power if you have genius you will yourselves take the lead in the building you design you will carve its porch and direct its disposition but for all subsequent advancement of its detail you must trust to the agency and the invention of others and it rests with you either to repress what faculties your workmen have into cunning subordination to your own or to rejoice in discovering even the powers that may rival you and leading forth mind after mind into fellowship with your fancy and association with your fame i need not tell you 
that if you do the first, if you endeavor to depress or disguise the talents of your subordinates, you are lost. For nothing could imply more darkly and decisively than this, that your art and your work were not beloved by you, that it was your own prosperity that you were seeking, and your own skill only that you cared to contemplate. I do not say that you must not be jealous at all. It is rarely in human nature to be holy without jealousy. And you may be forgiven for going some day sadly home, when you find some youth unpractised and unapproved giving the life-stroke to his work which you, after years of training perhaps, cannot reach. But your jealousy must not conquer, your love of your building must conquer, helped by your kindness of heart. See, I set no high or difficult standard before you. I do not say that you are to surrender your preeminence in mere unselfish generosity. But I do say that you must surrender your preeminence in your love of your building, helped by your kindness, and that whomsoever you find better able to do what will adorn it than you, that person you are to give place to, and to console yourselves for the humiliation first, by your joy in seeing the edifice grow more beautiful under his chisel, and secondly, by your sense of having done kindly and justly. But if you are morally strong enough to make the kindness and justice the first motive, it will be better, best of all if you do not consider it as kindness at all, but bare and stern justice. For truly, such help as we can give each other in this world is a debt to each other. And the man who perceives a superiority or a capacity in a subordinate, and neither confesses nor assists it, is not merely the withholder of kindness, but the committer of an injury. But be the motive what you will, only see that you do the thing, and take the joy of the consciousness that, as your art embraces a wider field than all others, and addresses a vaster multitude than all others, and is surer of audience than all others, so it is profounder and holier in fellowship than all others. The artist, when his pupil is perfect, must see him leave his side that he may declare his distinct, perhaps opponent, skill. Man of science wrestles with man of science for priority of discovery, and pursues in pangs of jealous haste his solitary inquiry. You alone are called by kindness, by necessity, by equity to fraternity of toil, and thus in those misty and massive piles which rise above the domestic roofs of our ancient cities, there was, there may be again, a meaning more profound and true than any that fancy so commonly has attached to them. Men say their pinnacles point to heaven. Why so does every tree that buds, and every bird that rises as it sings? Men say their isles are good for worship. Why, so is every mountain glen and rough seashore. But this they have of distinct and indisputable glory, that their mighty walls were never raised and shall never be but by men who love and aid each other in their weakness, that all their interlacing strength of vaulted stone has its foundation upon the stronger arches of manly fellowship, and all their changing grace of depressed or lifted pinnacle owes its cadence and completeness to sweeter cemeteries of human soul. End of section 10 Recorded by Todd Albrecht